Paul Volcker was appointed as chairman of the Fed in the United States in the early 1980s. Predecessor had been saying that uh, inflation is just out of control. The Fed can't control it. There's nothing we can do. It's, it's helpless. Volcker came in and said, we're going to stop this. We're going to do it. I'm going to do what it takes. We're going to get inflation down. And he did it. And it was expensive. We had a serious recession. It wasn't, it wouldn't have been, it wasn't popular to the extent that people understood what he was doing. But he was like the kind of general who knows what you have to do, and then you do it. The shift that I was involved in and when you're following a trail, you don't always know where it's going to lead. But the shift I was involved in was one where we think of two types of goods, physical objects and ideas. And traditionally, economics had been focused on the economics of objects, scarce objects. What we needed to do was start to grapple in a much more systematic way with the economics of ideas. So as you say, incentives matter for the discovery of new ideas. The kind of thing we often think about are what are the incentives for doing more investigation, trying more experiments, doing more work to, to, to discover. Increasingly, I think that underestimates uh, the activities that are involved in producing and distributing ideas. I may work very hard, I may see something and it becomes an insight in my brain, but it doesn't generate economic value unless I share it. To share it, I have to codify it in a way that can be printed or sent over the internet to other people. So, we need to think more about the incentives for codification and especially about for codifying clearly. Imagine, for example, my, your, my first paper that you struggled with. It was too hard. You know, that's, that was my fault. The 1990 paper, I worked very hard to make it easier to read. If I spent 10 hours and that reduced the time it took for people to read that paper by one minute, well, if I have 10,000 people who read the paper, that's a worthwhile effort. I think the incentives for clear codification, which just takes revision and revision and revision and testing with users and revising again, clearly codifying uh, a good idea uh, takes uh, strong incentives and we don't provide enough incentives for that. The final thing is you need incentives to tell the truth, because you can codify assertions that are false, because you didn't do enough work to check them, maybe because you knew they were false, but it will benefit you if some false assertions are accepted. And we even need to provide incentives for other people to test the assertions that others make and to surface the misrepresentations, the dishonesties, because that then creates a general tendency for people to be honest in their communication because they know there's a risk that they'll get caught. And that then leads to higher levels of trust. There's a saying that um, trust but verify. You need incentives to ensure that we, we verify. So I'm much more aware these days of whether or not they're asking whether we're providing enough incentives for clear codification and for verification and uh, for contributing to trust. Because one of the hallmarks of the digital revolution is that trust is going down. The noise is benefiting more than signal. And we're not doing enough of clarity of, of codification, at least on the side of those who are trying to tell the truth, and we're not doing enough to establish uh, what's, what's true and uh, what's, what's not true. And we're even not doing some simple things like 
pay, pay attention to who the author is. If you don't know who the person is, and you don't know uh, whether that person has a reputation for being reliable, don't read it. Don't even read it, because it won't help you to read information that somebody can use to slip, uh, slip noise or misstatements uh, to you. Deep message about the economics of ideas is that policy matters, even for technology, not just for the traditional inputs like capital and labor. Notion that catch up would be the general tendency um, needs to be revised and said that, well, with the right policies, countries can catch up. And we've seen some cases like South Korea with dramatic catch up in levels of income and technology. But with the wrong policies, that catch up won't happen. The knowledge doesn't flow unless you create the right incentives for it to, um, to come in. So policy matters, you have to get it right. And I think there, there are you know, very specific policies we should look at. The United States has generally been more willing to let firms pursue profit opportunities without uh, government uh, restrictions on what those firms can do. We had one firm that decided a good way to make profit would be to sell uh, opiates and get people addicted to opiates. They even had planned for making money later when people were addicted, they'd sell them the drugs that would help them uh, get better from being addicted. They made billions of dollars. They've killed hundreds of thousands of people. Uh, opiates, uh, opioids alone may be a non-trivial part of the problem we see in life expectancy in the United States, maybe even um, some of the fall off in labor force participation. So if you have a government that says, well, we don't wanna, we don't wanna regulate, that would, um, uh, that would interfere with innovation, that's not the kind of government I want if the regulation in question is, can you start a business where you try and get a bunch of people addicted and kill them to make money? I, I don't want to live in a country that allows that kind of a business model. So uh, remember, there are always two sides to the, well, the less, regula less regulated, more market-oriented uh, approach might give you some benefits in some sectors, but it, it can come at a real cost. And this may not be a popular opinion, but I uh, hold it and I'll voice it. I think we should be more supportive of strong executive powers. When we talk about a government that can strong enough to say no, I think of this fundamentally as a government that has strong executives who can make the final decision. To illustrate how this could play out, Paul Volcker was appointed as chairman of the Fed in the United States in the early 1980s, um, the, his predecessor had been saying that uh, inflation is just out of control. The Fed can't control it. There's nothing we can do. It's, it's helpless. Volcker came in and said, we're going to stop this. We're going to do it. I'm going to do what it takes. We're going to get inflation down. And he did it. And it was expensive. We had a serious recession. It wasn't it wouldn't have been, it wasn't popular to the extent that people understood what he was doing, but he was like the kind of general who knows what you have to do and then you do it. And I think we too often have this idealized notion of some big committee that will talk about it and reach consensus. That is not historically how big problems have been solved. Big problems have been solved because one person took responsibility made the hard decisions, and then had the courage to stick with it, and we move forward. And you know, there are cases where that one person makes terrible decisions, and we gotta have a mechanism to get them out of the job when they're making the wrong decisions. But generally, when they're going in the right direction, you need to leave them alone. And I think we should avoid this tendency towards the consensus-based committee solution and we should also avoid this tendency we see all over the world now of judicial review, where we're, we ask some judges to second guess every government decision. If we want the government to be strong, we have to commit to some leaders in government 
who can be executives and take personal responsibility. And um, they may not be popular, but um, that may be what you need to achieve some of these reforms. Yeah, thank you very much.